You've already learned that all living things are made of cells. But there are a few different types of cells, and that's what we'll look at right now. The types of cells that I want you to learn about right now are these. Bacteria, eukaryotes, and archaea. And, as a matter of fact, all living things on Earth consist of either of these types of cells. But of course, not all biologists agree with this, but right now, this will make do. Let's start by looking at some bacterial cells. On this agar plate, you can see a whole lot of bacterial colonies. Agar is a kind of nutrient on which you can grow bacteria, and each colony here consists of millions of bacterial cells. These bacteria are of a non-dangerous type called E. coli, a type of bacterium that is commonly found in our intestines. If you stain them with a red coloring agent and look at them in a microscope, they look a little bit like small rods. In this picture, a scanning electron microscope image, you can see a bunch of E. coli clumped together. You can also see this measuring bar here, telling us that bacteria are about 1 to 2 micrometers long. Bacteria are common in the order of a micrometer in length, that is a thousandth of a millimeter or a millionth of a meter. Pretty small indeed. Now let's write some notes about this too. This is how I usually draw a typical bacterial cell, a somewhat rounded rectangle like this. The bacterium is enclosed by a cell membrane. I've talked about cell membranes in a previous video. They mainly consist of phospholipids. But there are also a lot of proteins lodged in the cell membrane. These proteins regulate what may enter and what may exit the cell, among other things. Inside the cell membrane, in the cell, we find the cytoplasm. This is the intracellular fluid in which everything else in the cell floats around. And one of the things is the cell's DNA, its genetic material. In bacteria, there's only one chromosome, and it's circular as I show here. Quite often, it's also attached to the cell membrane like this. Now, I also add a lot of green dots. In this figure, they represent something called ribosomes. What I want you to write down and learn is that ribosomes are thingamabobs that synthesize proteins. But exactly how they do that, I'll explain in a later video. Just take this to your notes for now. Many bacteria also have a kind of cell wall, but far from every type of bacterium has that. And on top of that, there's a lot of other stuff in a bacterial cell, but right now there's not enough space or time to go through more than this. Now, let's look at some eukaryotic cells instead. There are three types of eukaryotic cells as well, and first of all, there are animal cells. Let's draw a simple human being, which is a kind of animal anyway. There are also plant cells that of course make up plants. Then there are also fungal cells, but they are quite similar to animal cells, so I won't consider them any further in this video. So what do animal cells look like? These are so-called epithelial cells, scraped from the inside of the cheek of some poor student of mine. They are stained with a blue dye, methylene blue, which binds particularly well to DNA. Thanks to this, the cell's nuclei are clearly visible in the cells. But then, of course, I have to explain what a nucleus is and what a typical eukaryotic animal cell looks like. I usually draw it like this, somewhat more shapeless than a bacterial cell. Like the bacterial cell, the eukaryotic cell is enclosed by a cell membrane of phospholipids that regulate what comes into and goes out of the cell. And speaking of bacteria, let's draw a bacterium here for reference. Now, both bacteria and eukaryotic cells may vary quite a lot in size, but a eukaryotic cell is roughly 10 to 100 times larger than a bacterial cell. What's particular about eukaryotic cells is that they contain a nucleus. And that's actually what the word eukaryote means. Eu is Greek for true, and karyon means nut or kernel. And as I said earlier, the nucleus contains the cell's DNA. Contrary to bacteria, the chromosomes in the eukaryotic cells are more than one. In humans, for example, they are 46. Also, they are linear. The nucleus is enclosed by a nuclear envelope that also is a kind of phospholipid membrane. And inside of the cell, it's not void at all, but instead cytoplasm, a kind of intracellular fluid. Something that is also different from bacteria is that eukaryotic cells contain so-called organelles. These can be seen as small organs, which perform specialized functions in the cell. 
One such organelle is the mitochondrion. Sometimes it's called the cell's power plant, because in it the cellular respiration takes place, that is, the combustion of glucose from which the cell gets its energy. From the nuclear envelope, a large membrane system called the endoplasmic reticulum is extended. It's often abbreviated ER. What I want you to learn about the ER right now, that is, that it can be seen as kind of an enzyme station. By this, I mean that on the ER, there are a lot of enzymes that perform different chemical reactions that the cell needs. For example, one can find a lot of ribosomes on the ER, even if there are also ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And, as you remember from earlier, the ribosomes, that's where the protein synthesis takes place. If you think that there are a lot of things to remember and learn about the eukaryotic cells, perhaps you can find some comfort in that there is a lot more stuff than I've covered so far. And I actually think this is enough. Except for plant cells, of course. There are yet a few things that you must learn. That's why we now turn to a typical plant cell and what we find there. First of all, let's write that down, that plant cells are eukaryotic cells. This means they have, for example, a cell membrane, a nucleus with an endoplasmic reticulum, and they have mitochondria. But what's special for plant cells is that they also have a cell wall made of cellulose. The cell wall gives the cell and plant stability and support so that it, for example, can grow to a tall tree. Plant cells may also contain organelles that look something like this. This is a so-called chloroplast, and that's where the photosynthesis takes place. In a lot of plant cells, there's also something called a vacuole. It's a membrane-enclosed compartment filled with a watery fluid. The vacuole expands like a balloon and keeps the cell stretched out. If, for example, a potted plant has gone without water for a few days, it wilts because the vacuoles shrink. But when water is available again, the vacuoles take up water and they expand, stretching out the cell and eventually the whole plant. And just like animal cells, there's quite a lot more in plant cells, but for now, this is quite enough. Now let's turn our attention to something that's called the endosymbiotic theory. This theory describes how the first eukaryotic cells formed. Once upon a time, many, many million years ago, there were no eukaryotic cells. But there was a kind of cell that I here call a prekaryotic cell, a cell before the eukaryotic cells. Today, we believe that this was some kind of archaeon, or at least a cell related to the archaea, but I'll return to that shortly. Anyway, one day, this prekaryotic cell decided to engulf a bacterium which could take advantage of the air's oxygen and use it to combust glucose. But instead of digesting the bacterium, the bacterium started to live inside the cell. This became an endosymbiosis. Endo for inside of, sim for together, and biosis for life. A life together inside of the cell. This bacterium, perhaps most closely related to today's rickettsia bacteria, eventually evolved into mitochondria. This means that the mitochondria inside our cells actually have their own DNA and they replicate more or less by themselves independent of the host cell. Let's also consider what happened when plant cells formed. At this time, there were already eukaryotic cells, but at some point, one of them decided to engulf a bacterium with the ability to perform photosynthesis. In roughly the same way as previous of the mitochondrion, this bacterium started to live inside the eukaryotic cell and eventually evolved into a chloroplast. In this way, a plant cell formed. And the bacterium that was initially engulfed, it was probably closest related to today's cyanobacteria, something we have learned by studying their DNA. Now, let's study the archaea. From the looks, they're quite similar to bacteria. They are approximately the same size, and they both lack nuclei. Something that sets them apart from the bacteria, however, is that they are often found in extreme environments. Extremely salt, extremely hot, or extremely acid environments. Their biochemistry is also quite different from the bacteria. Because of this, they were considered being more original than the bacteria, hence the name archibacteria, literally old bacteria. But they are not bacteria and thus should only be called archaea. 
And then there's also this, that it probably was an archaeon that was the prekaryotic cell that eventually evolved into a eukaryotic cell. We have learned this by comparing the DNA of so-called low-key archaeota organisms to eukaryotic cells. Last of all, let's revise some concepts that I want you to remember. Or actually, some concepts that I would like you to remember to forget. First, there are no archaeobacteria. You still see this word pop up from time to time in the literature, but since they're not bacteria, there is nothing called archaeobacteria. Nope, archaea is the correct concept. Sometimes you also see the concept eubacteria, that is, true bacteria, to differ them from archaeobacteria. But since there are no archaeobacteria, there is no need for the concept eubacteria. Instead, we just call them bacteria. So, we then have three types of cells. Bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes. Quite often, bacteria and archaea are put in one single group called prokaryotes. This has been done historically, as bacteria and archaea look almost the same through the microscope. Unfortunately, this is not a good idea, since putting them in the same group also suggests that they are closely related. But now, recent studies have shown that archaea and eukaryotes are actually more closely related than archaea and bacteria. So, I would like you to cross out this concept as well. But, to be honest, I think it will be very difficult to weed out that concept. As you will probably learn during your biology studies, many biologists use the word prokaryote and bacterium completely synonymously, like if they mean exactly the same thing. Oh well, now I've covered prokaryotes as well, and you know what it means. And you also know that it's obsolete and really shouldn't be used at all. Either you talk of bacteria or you talk of archaea. Or eukaryotes, of course. As always, don't forget that you can learn more and check your learning on my homepage. You'll find a link in the description.